Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Sloppy Lab. Uh, I am JT Russell, and I've had uh, just about enough of the water-based attacks this week. I went down to the store and asked for some Quick Dry 3000, but I think the guy misheard me because <laughs> I'm here tonight with good stuff. <laughs> good stuff. Quick Draw 3457. <laughs> Instead. The tide is high this week, isn't it, JT? Oh, the tide is too high. The tide is too high. Uh, uh, I had some some water issues on the home front, and then uh, also uh, also took an uh, an L, a one two loss in NKFL to hydrophilic attack. So, <laughs> so mm -hmm. the tide was high all around. You know, <laughs> was was he playing all DT decks? Uh, uh he was not. He was not. Um, you know, uh, Hydro, I give a lot of credit to because they uh, uh, have not been changing up their lineup at all. I think they've had the same lineup for a number of seasons now, and uh, they do really well with it. So um, it's good. So it's good. Yeah. 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 Nice. Something to be said for for knowing your knowing your deck and honing your tools uh, and uh, and making it work. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. I'll eventually play enough seasons of NKFL to kind of get there i'm just still feeling like the adjustment period of like you know picking out flaws in my lineup and having to live with them for an entire season and then looking forward to next season to kind of yeah. fix that up it's um really cool format of discovery though in that regard um well that's the yeah. uh that's the trick isn't it there's a trade-off between using these using these formats these many deck formats as a as a tool for discovery or as a tool for honing um and I don't think either of them is necessarily right or better, um, but uh, but it's a it's an interesting trade off, you know. Um, I I feel that I feel the tension between those two poles for sure. Yep, for sure. Yeah. Uh, thanks for watching Data Forge Dream. Um, please feel free to work all evening, all, all night. <laughs> yes, indeed. And I got to give a plug to while we're at it. I'm very excited to be joining Jada Forge stream tomorrow um, for some Zock Tales. Nice. Yeah. I, I the was, debut episode. I was very close to breaking into a song, some DuckTales song there. Maybe I'll hone it for tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, we don't want to get this this show removed for copyright infringement. For though, copyright infringement. If I could do a I'm, passable. I'm sure, you, I'm sure you would nail it where the AI that detects that stuff would immediately pick it up. Yep, yep, yeah. We'd be, we'd be busted. Uh, oh, cool. Well, uh, well, it's not n '90s cartoons we're talking. '80s, '90s cartoons we're talking tonight. I think it's '90s. I think it's '90s. Uh, it was certainly yeah. present in the '90s. I can tell you that for sure. I can tell you that for sure. Um, uh, what are we talking tonight? What are we talking tonight? We're selling out the train. <laughs> <laughs> we're selling out the what? <laughs> we're we're continuing the sellout train. <laughs> yeah, we had some uh, some good ideas we threw around for. Um, how to fully sell out the stream. Um, mm -hmm. But we're going to wait because there was some news that interrupted those sellout plans today. Mm -hmm. uh, Ghost Galaxy dropped some updates to the uh, rule book and the tournament guide, which uh, some of them had pretty big impacts in how we're going to play in real life and uh, mm -hmm. just in general. Um, so we are actually going to pivot and we're going to talk about this tonight and kind of go down through the rule book and the tournament guide updates, go through everything that we could pick out that uh, is a change and how that might affect play so that you don't have to read through all of that red print in the rule book to figure out what's different and uh, what it used to be. We're going to try to uh, sloppily do that for you so you guys don't have to. Yeah, right on, right on. I uh, figure probably, probably going to be top of mind for most of the content creators out there uh, this week. But hey, Tuesday is our day and, uh, you know, the iron is hot. So let's strike. Um, right. Keep so releasing it, news on Tuesday, Ghost Galaxy. You know right, that? it's right. great. And uh, and I know I've been trumpeting our 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 new schedule of releasing every other Tuesday or the Tuesday after we record. But uh, <laughs> apology in advance because folks are probably going to get a less polished uh, episode this week. <laughs> yeah. I think I want to keep it timely. So mm -hmm. if you uh, are checking out the podcast on Wednesday the nineteenth, hopefully. We'll have this one so it'll actually be relevant so yeah um but there were three different documents that they released slash updated today um there was the learn to play guide there was the rule book version 17 and there was the tournament rules and guide or trg 
version 1.2, and we're going to try to talk about all three of those. Um, we're going to go quickly, um, and I guess we will have like our the big story, which I think some people in, in the Discord servers have already been talking about. We're going to save that one for the end. Uh, rest assured, we will talk about the big one. But um, we're going to get to the small ones first and try to just get through uh, and hit on a lot of these changes that, that might impact how you're playing Keyforge in the future. Mm-hmm. Right on. Cool. So first up, uh, I actually this actually didn't hit my radar, so I'm glad you uh, you noticed it. But there's this learn to play guide. Um, so what is up with the learn to play guide? Quick draw. Yeah. So the learn to play guide. They talked about it in one of their YouTube videos they released about two weeks ago or so. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be included in the new two player boxes that they're uh, releasing, and their new two player box has like a different format of how they're going to be releasing them in the future. They're going to have the same branding, the same image on them going forward, and there's going to be a sticker that tells you which set has the decks inside of it. Um, but I think what they're all going to include is these learn to play decks, and included in that is a walkthrough of how to play a game. Um, what I really like about this is that they have like the cards sort of like quote unquote randomized. You know, it's like supposed to be just a regular deck but they are ordered very specifically and numbered so that if you're going through the guide, it'll tell you like step one, draw your hand. Here's what's going to be in your hand. And it's already laid out. And it's just a really good walkthrough of the game to teach new players. And uh, this kind of like resonates with me because I recently, probably like a few months ago, played a game Oath that did this as well. And I thought it was a fantastic teaching tool. So I'm really looking forward to being able to use this to teach people Keyforge in the future. Um, I think it's just a very clear way that you can walk through it and you don't have to, you know, ha everyone has their own teaching style, right? And I think mm -hmm. this is going to try to standardize it, make it very simple, hit on the important points and show good examples of how it's going to work in practice. So I think it's a really cool idea. So do you know if this, if these decks in this guide takes you all the way through a complete game or does it kind of like, here's a few turns, now go fly? Yeah, I think it's just a turn or two, probably a couple turns, um, okay. maybe each player. Um, but it just gives you like, I, I think it's curated in a way that will ensure that over those first few turns, you're going to see a fight, you're going to see a reap, you're going to see di like, different card types, you get like a little bit of, here's how they all work. And that's what's so nice about it, because if you're teaching someone for the first time, and you shuffle up decks and give it to them, they might have a handful of all creatures and not mm -hmm. know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. Or they might... Um, have like all creatures and then the first turn they're like why can't i fight anything and you know like this is written in a way I, i'm sure it will be in a way that is kind of touching on all the different aspects of the rules that you're going to need to know in probably the most efficient um and efficient manner hmm. cool cool well we'll look out for that uh, yeah. definitely we'll have some folks that i might be interested in teaching soon so let's do it <laughs> I, I just taught someone a couple days ago and um this would have been really cool but i think it went okay anyway so we'll see yeah, my my daughter who my oldest who is uh eight keeps asking about Keyforge. I don't know if she's quite ready, but we'll we'll see. Yeah. This might be a good chance. Good Try it chance. out. Cool. So what do we got next? All right. So the next one is a pretty big update. It was rule book version seventeen. Um there are a lot of changes in there and I, it sounded like the way they talked about it in the article was that um there's a lot of things highlighted in red that are not necessarily new. They're just moved around. Maybe they're reworded. Mm -hmm. So I kind of had to go through here and skim it relatively quickly to try to find the things that were actually different in this one compared to previous versions. And so um, if I did not find everything, you can blame S.T. Russell. Mm -hmm. He's just been missing in action for a while, and he's, <laughs> he's like our fact checker. So um, if something's not right, talk to the fact checker. ST Russell. Um, but I think I got everything here. Um, I went top down and I think these are in order still. So like, I kind of just took notes on everything that caught my eye. And the first okay. one was the discard bonus icon. So cool. Which, yeah, great idea. I think a lot of people, I actually thought like a few months ago, really cool if they had a discard bonus icon. Mm -hmm. um, Cause they have currently like the draw icon, which is a card with a plus and the discard is a card with a minus very logical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and it just allows you to discard any card from your hand of your choice. Um, and I kind of wish it was working both ways. Like I wish it could be like force your opponent to discard one of your like randomly or discard one of your own, but it's just your own. Um, <sighs> but it's still a very cool mechanic. Nonetheless, I, I could probably see it being a drawback in some cases and potentially um, a bonus in others. I mean, this this puts the sloppy and sloppy lab work. How can you uh, how can you dislike it, right? <laughs> yeah, it's like a, the ancient yerk as well. Like imagine the ancient yerk with three discard. Like, Oof. 
Oof. you could see that as like it's kind of the same thing kind of um and you could definitely see that as a drawback to the card yeah i could see see too much being a drawback it would be interesting to talk through what are situations where you would prefer i mean there are there are obvious ones but in general maybe uh whether the random discard or uh self discard uh, is more powerful but uh, either way i'm excited for this one i do feel like a modal maybe a modal one where you get to choose would be a little bit a little bit strong but i mean i suppose you could balance that with uh the cards that they're attached to um though i don't know there's going to be some really interesting uh really interesting cards generated from this depending on how prevalent um enhancements are kind of going forward yeah Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and how prevalent the discard is as well, because it's going to be on a random card. It's not like mm-hmm. Ancient York gets three of them. It's more of like a random card in your deck is going to get, you know, these these icons just like you would any other enhancements. So it'll be uh, pretty interesting, but I'm looking forward to that. I think it's a very cool mechanic. Evil Cronus coming. I know it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that would be great. Oh, the return of Evil Twin someday. I would love that. That would be very cool. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, cool. All right, so just going again top down in the rules. Um, the next thing that caught my eye was a chain handicap. Um, I don't think this was there before. Um, it talked about chain bidding in one instance, and uh, chain bidding we all are very familiar with as well, whether it's an adaptive best of one, um, something like that. But the chain handicap was specifically a way of balancing games against newer or less skilled players. And it suggests starting with uh, four chains given to the more experienced player. And if they win two in a row, then you would add a chain to it, make it five. Um, if they lose two in a row, you would take a chain back. Um, I just thought it was an interesting uh, addition to kind of balancing the game. I don't know how I feel about it yet. It feels a lot like largely unnecessary um, because you also have the variable, not just of player skill and experience, but of the decks that you're playing. Mm. So it's going to be pretty hard, I think. There's not going to be like, that four chains is not going to be a perfect way to balance a game from the start. It's going to take a lot of refining, I think, between you and the other person and the decks you're playing before you find that sweet spot of like what chain handicap works to make yeah. a balanced game. So this this is actually more interesting to me in in how it um and how it reveals some of their their thinking uh around the balance and uh collector element, collectorship, I guess, of the game, right? Um, it makes a lot more sense to not worry about the deck and just worry about the players if you have a small collection if you got two decks and you always play the good one you know then then maybe this makes sense and it also kind of suggests that they think that maybe you know three or four chains is kind of a level increment between players and that's a good place to start um so so those are kind of some interesting kind of behind the scenes uh glimpses into how they're thinking about the game and balancing and uh you know how folks maybe coming into the game might approach collecting or, or the size of their collection. I don't know. Yeah. Just, yeah. yeah, I might try that with uh, some of my friends that I'm teaching. You know, it, when you're doing it like for your first game, it's confusing because for me personally, like the first time that I play a game, mm-hmm. I want to play with like how the game's played. Right. And if you all of a sudden institute like chains from the very beginning, it's kind of confusing, I think, to the person who's learning the game. So I think you probably only want to do this after that person has an understanding of the game and the mechanics and how it works. Then you can maybe introduce that. But, you know, a lot of my friends and I think a lot of people that play Keyforge are fairly competitive. And so it shouldn't be necessary after very long to use something like that. Hmm. Fair enough. Fair enough. (laughs) Uh, All right. So there is another keyword that is just a little further down called scrap. Um, I, I scrap is a oh you missed scrap scrap mm-hmm. is a good one um, the scrap keyword uh, I'll just try to read it straight from the rules for you so I don't butcher the interpretation but it is um, just like any other like uh, fight reap play those kind of things it's it's scrap instead of play so it says after a card with a scrap ability is discarded from a player's hand the active player resolves the card's scrap ability scrap abilities can resolve in the discard pile um, and so it's basically um, if you discard it by choice or if you have another card that discards it, you will trigger this uh, this bonus. Uh, and so I would imagine it gives cards uh, two different options. It'll have a play effect. It'll have a scrap effect. Maybe it's a creature that'll just be a, you know, a vanilla creature with a scrap effect if you don't want it as a creature instead. Mm. Um, but there could be a lot of synergies in there with things like 
uh, I don't know, if punctuated equilibrium ever comes back, or you know, oh, there's I think the old tinker says you may discard a card from your hand. Um, things like that could you know have some extra synergy with the scrap keyword. Um, very cool idea though. I'm very much in favor of this. You know how much we love discarding cards. <laughs> Just more incentive to discard all the cards. <laughs> yeah, nice. Yep. I like it. I like it. Okay. I know a lot, a lot of people say like discarding cards is not fun. They want to play their cards. Maybe this will help alleviate that feeling. Like at least your card's still doing something. Like you're kind of playing it, but it just becomes a different action. So I had an NKFL match today um, where I was playing Stealth Warper, which is uh, a Quixel Stone deck of mine that also sports auto encoder. And my opponent had Snecklifter and I found myself discarding auto encoder and then having much less fun discarding cards than I normally would, but yeah, but still doing it. What, what are you going to do? Still doing it. Yeah, <laughs> with the Quixel Stone, you still want to discard for sure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, all right. So the scrap keyword is going to be a lot of fun. I don't think there's anything like that in Winds of Exchange, but they're laying the groundwork for future expansions, which is kind of a nice tease. I like it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right. Oh, go ahead. No, I was just saying, interesting that they're using this as a platform for some teasing. Yeah. Uh, you figure, yeah. I feel like usually you'd see these things being included just before a relevant release, but um, but cool, I dig it. Yeah, I do too. It's it's putting some excitement for a rules release, which is interesting. You know, like people would normally mm-hmm. just be like, "Oh, it's pretty boring. It's just a rule book," but this makes it a little bit more exciting. Cool. Uh, all right. So this next one, I don't know if this is a change. Um, you could tell me if this is how it's always been or not. But face down cards, they just clarified that you can always look at face down cards that are under cards you control. So for example, Jargogel put a card face down, you're always allowed to look at the jar Google card. Is that the case now? I know TCO does not work like that. TCO doesn't work like that. Um, I think it's generally, at least, I, I don't know if there's ever been official wording on it, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, but I believe that's kind of the way it's generally been played at most kitchen tables, if I had to guess. So nice that it's yeah. been officially clarified if it wasn't that way before. Yeah, and then I'll apply to tokens as well. You can always look at your own tokens. But, Super relevant for tokens. Um, and it was also some clarifications there, like you can do it for face down cards under cards you control. I don't know if there's any cards that put cards face down under something your opponent controls, but if you did, you would not be able to look at that card under your opponent's cards, but they could. Hmm. So it it matters more about um, who controls the card that it's under as opposed to who owns the card that's face down. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. There's some, hmm. uh, some design space in there, I think, for that kind of rule. Yeah, yeah, kind of the specificity nudges at uh, some potential des- future future designs. <laughs> yes, exactly. I like it. Yeah. Um, here's another one that I, a couple more here that I don't know if they're new, but they're worth mentioning. Um, there is a section on lose first gain. If you lose a keyword or if you gain a keyword, and just like the cannot overrules can, uh, the lose will overrule gain. So if you uh, have a card that gives you taunts, and you have a card that says opponent's creatures lose taunt, the lose taunt will take precedence. Cool. cool, cool. Pretty straightforward. Pretty straightforward. Mm-hmm. Um, again, don't know if that one's new. Um, Omega, the keyword, had some clarifications, and this one I'm also pretty sure is not a functional change, but it's nice that they spelled it out completely. Um, they gave confirmation that damage pips or play effects that kill Chronophage um, the creature or the card playing it will still have Omega if it's like a artifact or a, a creature that does that. Um, so that was always widely ex- expected. I think it was ruled in some cases informally that that's how it works. I've had some games kind of like come into question, like, is that how it really works? It mm-hmm. is correct. Um, so if the creature dies, like the Omega keyword is triggered as the card leaves your hand, basically. And then after it leaves your hand, it has Omega. It can't lose Omega. And you do everything that it tells you to do uh, and go through it. Um, and the corollary to this, um, which I thought was really interesting, if you play a cyber clone on a Dusk Witch, do you think that it has Omega or not? Well, I can read the notes. <laughs> you could read the notes. You pretend you didn't read the notes. Uh, I, I guess I would have, my intuition would have said that it has Omega. Uh, but if yeah, I'm thinking through too. it now, I would probably say that it does have Omega, but it's not doesn't have omega at the time when it matters does that make sense i think that's correct that's how i would interpret it as well but they specifically said it if you play a cyber clone on a dusk witch 
it will not end your turn immediately. Mm -hmm. um, it, it will not have the Omega until it becomes that creature, which is after the window where Omega triggers. So right, right. Because I'm looking at the I'm looking at the kind of uh, wording for Omega, the Omega keyword, and it's it's not that. Uh, it's a thing that kicks in kind of after the thing is fully resolved, if that's how you want to call it. It's um, it's a keyword or a play effect that creates a lasting effect, right? Yes. Uh, so interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Again, I don't know if that was a new one, but it, it's nice to have that clarity. Um, and that's a pretty cool combo that I was not aware of. So if you have a Cyberclone in, in your deck and your opponent's got a Dusk Witch, just wait, build up a big hand of creatures, yeah. and uh, you're in business. And I... I should probably be be careful too, because I'm not sure that it's right to say it's a play effect, but it's an effect that uh, is created as the card either enters play or is revealed. So that's interesting. Yeah, interesting. So actually, the Cyberclone won't. Too. Yeah, I, I'm getting Cyberclone partially mixed up with Mimic Gel and the uh, the other one. Cyberclone does not gain that Dusk Witch's um, ability. I think that's the right. Um, right, you're thinking Mimic Gel. I think Mimic Gel. Yeah, I do get those mixed up a lot, but still, nonetheless, it's an interesting rule. Um, although if you play the mimic gel, I think that would still work, right? Like you could mimic gel. Mimic gel enters play as a copy of another creature in play, except it belongs uh, to the no. house. Okay. So if it enters play, it specifically says that. I mean, you thing. cannot get that. Yeah. Cause the Omega rules talk about entering play, right? Yes. Creates the lasting effect as the card enters play or as immediately after it is revealed for, for actions. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. So maybe, maybe can't have like some big combo here, but um, hmm. interesting anyway to note the way the cyber clone interacts with Omega creatures. Yeah. That's, that's cool. That's cool. Um, all right. So um, splash attack is a new keyword that we already knew about. Um, a lot of creatures have splash attack in Winds of Exchange. Um, there was one line that stuck out to me on the splash attack, though, that I thought was interesting. It said, creatures that are destroyed by splash attack damage are considered to have been destroyed in a fight as well as destroyed fighting the attacked creature. I don't know if that's going to make a big difference. There could be some cards like uh, Warsong, which I'm not sure if it's in Winds of Exchange, mm -hmm. um, where they would... No, is it not Warsong? What is it? Barn Raising, where they lose an amber each time a creature is destroyed in a fight. If barn raising is in this set, which um, I'm not sure if it is, I think you're looking it up now. Um, you could fight with a splash attack creature, kill three things, and make them lose three amber. Um, I would not have expected that those creatures that died a splash attack would have been considered to have been destroyed in a fight, but they are. Hmm. Yeah, we, we may have to find a, a good example. Barn raising cares about just the creatures, the count of creatures fighting. Um, Hmm. Yeah, I think this one this one may not be terribly may, may be completely new. Um, but I I would have probably not not intuited it to work this way. So it's cool to cool to be calling calling out. Yeah, I think uh, it, it's a little bit different than assault too, because like if a creature is killed with assault, the fight doesn't happen. But is that creature still considered to have been destroyed in a fight? I think so. Yeah, this is this one is weird, is weird, and I always I always mix it up. But I think the uh, the 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 rules judges are are we're we're actually just teeing up the bad printy press ask a judge, which is like giving <laughs> them fodder for the next like free content ten, ten for bad ten. penny press. Yeah, right. Uh, but I think that uh, you are considered to have fought with a creature, but fight. I don't think that the fight actually triggers. Um, yeah. I think I think so too because if I know like if you have a creature with a uh, uh, assault and an after fight effect and the assault kills it it will not trigger the after fight effect and and here's the exact here's the exact working so you still used the creature to fight um, right but the rest of the fight does not happen if the assault damage kills it right so that makes sense um, uh, why you, why you don't get those those fight keywords but you do care about things you do get the benefit from things that care about when you use a creature to fight yep. yes yep yep okay makes sense makes sense flash attack so yeah a little weird but it's a cool mechanic um mm. one of those things i think it kind of already existed um uh, there's a few cards that don't they say like before fight deal two damage to each neighbor 
there are, uh, and they do call them splash damage. And then there's there's even some that say deal one splash X. Um, I think yeah, it, for the for attacking specifically though and fighting specifically, um, this is kind of a cool clarification. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, something to think about. I'm sure, there's going to be more implications. Um, all right, there are two new keywords that were added. Um, one is treachery, um, and the treachery keyword says that cards that have treachery enter play under your opponent's control. So um, I would think it's the same thing as Scally Caper, how Scally Caper works. Mm -hmm. um, but there's, again, no cards in Winds of Exchange with treachery that I know of. Um, but also, you know, I like the design space opened up by this. Sauropod. Sauropod? Sauropod is another one that might kind of count for that. Um, mm -hmm. Similar type of mechanic, yeah. Yeah. And I wonder, so Sauropod is not in the set that I recall. Um, I don't recall. Hmm? Know, could it be labor, could it be kind of legacyed in and then with the keyboard it would be interesting yeah it'd be interesting to see yeah there's it. yeah there's no errata issued so far to scally caper or to the trojan sauropod mm -hmm. um but then there was um an errata issued to knowledge is power which was like really just a a, a formatting a templating errata hmm. it doesn't affect how the card's played but it was actually changed to say um like a play effect archive a card or gain uh gain one for each like the or template like uh forgive or forget like sink or swim how it's like kind of templated like that they've technically eroded knowledge is power to to read like that that's um, cool so not a functional change but yeah more of like a style change yeah and the the errata potential errata for say trojan sauropod or scally caper i mean could could be significant having having a keyword kind of gives you um a hook that you can reference elsewhere like it's very clunky to be like search your deck for a card that can be enter play under your opponent's control right but you could say like go find yeah. a, a card with treachery like that's a thing you can do so it's kind of a, a referenceable attribute um yeah or maybe maybe they'll make a card that says um give opponent control of all your cards with treachery or you your, know like your cards lose treachery or something yeah like there could be something which would have an impact then you're right mm -hmm. cool so, all right um, so second keyword that they're adding uh, is versatile. Um, if a card has the versatile keyword, it can be used as if it belonged to the active house. Um, I compare that to Mantle of the Zealot, essentially being an upgrade that says this creature gains versatile. I think that's pretty similar, um, but mm -hmm. a cool mechanic nonetheless. So I know I know uh, we're trying to go kind of quickly through these, but I'm curious what, what your take is on the addition of some of these keywords in general, especially when they're not super heavily used and don't kind of appear to be that prevalent in, in woe either. Right. Like I, I tend to favor kind of explicitly spelling some of these out and it's, it's great if you have keyword and some helper text, like that's cool. Um, but I don't know. I, I always worry, not worry, but I think you can kind of mindful as a game designer of having too much just jargon, like jargon itself has a weight to it. Uh, and so yeah. if, if you kind of throw things out like, oh, treacherous, versatile, you know, elusive skirmish, you know, these things do add up and, and can be detrimental to new players. So on the one hand, you have this ability to add like a flavorful, a flavorful label to a thing that's common in your game. And that's awesome. Uh, on the other hand, if it's not something that gets used a ton, then you're, you're kind of adding weight and, and a little bit of friction for, for newer players. Um, so no, uh, these two yeah. these two are kind of mm, stretches to me. But I don't know if you have a, <laughs> a take. Yeah, no, I kind of see where you're going with it. Um, I think that if they, I, I think it's important for a game to kind of add this stuff slowly over time. And they're not adding it at Winds of Exchange. Um, maybe the set after that, I forget what it's called. Um, maybe they add this stuff in then. Um, you know, scrap treachery, versatile, you know, all that stuff. If it's all coming in one set. I would hope that that is the set's gimmick that they're like, like in uh, worlds collide. That was like the gimmick was they added in rage and ward. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I think it was in rages. Yeah. Enraged didn't exist in any way. Right. 
there was no one rage in AOA because Worlds Collide was the, like, oh my gosh, so many tokens, <laughs> so many new uh, counters, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. So what I wouldn't want is to add this stuff like Dark Tidings gimmick was the tide. Uh, Winds of Exchange is going to be the tokens. The next set, I hope, is like a few different keywords like this. I hope it's not like introducing a different 37th card plus keywords. You know, like that could be like a lot too quickly. Hmm. Um, so I kind of I kind of agree with what you're coming with, but I am very okay with adding this stuff slowly over time. Now, like the weird thing is that you maybe kind of think about this differently too, is because I used to play Magic the Gathering when I was a kid. Um, probably stopped playing early 2000s. Um, I don't remember the exact year. And I felt like it was fairly simple, um, pretty easy to, to learn the rules. Um, and then obviously as expansions come out, they no longer tell you what trample means or what flying means. You know, like they, they get rid of that. And Keyforge has done the same thing where they no longer tell you what elusive means or skirmish. They expect you to know it. And um, I bring up magic because I've looked at more modern magic cards that have come out in the last five years. Mm -hmm. And I have no idea how they work. I don't understand. <laughs> I don't understand the game anymore. I think there's been too much of it added over time that someone like me, like I'm not genuinely interested in going back to magic in any way, but um, whenever I'm curious and I see a card, I'm like, I read it and I'm like, I have no clue what this card does because mm -hmm. there's all these different things going on in it. And so, you know, you could argue that Keyforge maybe will become that over time. Um, it's too soon to say that for that. Too soon to say, but I I think that there is it is that's that's the trap. That's what you have to worry about because um, they do accumulate, and if you have formats that are that reach back to the start of the game, then you know it's it's a lot to not know what slice of twenty years you're going to be sitting down across from, and uh, yeah. and having to carry around that encyclopedia is a is can be a lot. Be a I'm going to go out on a limb and say that. Um, if Ghost Galaxy has that problem in 20 years with Keyforge, they're going to be pretty happy. They're going to be pretty happy. Yeah. That's fair. Yeah. <laughs> Very fair. <laughs> um, I don't know. You could argue that maybe this inhibits their ability to get to 20 years. Who knows? I'll tell you in 20 years. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. So there was another clarification. Um, added on creatures played as upgrades this was kind of one that i think was like a up in the air for a while like um if you have a matter maker out and you have an explo rover from star alliance in your hand can you play the explo rover as an upgrade on an off house turn and the answer is yes you can they've confirmed that you can um so anything that allows you to play something as an upgrade will work with those creatures. Um, one thing you cannot do, as it gave as an example, was you cannot use Dr. Faroctor, for example, to place an explorer over on top of your deck. Because with, when it's in an out of play state, it is a creature. Um, but if a card allows you to play an upgrade, the explorer over says you may play it as an upgrade, then you're allowed to play it. Mm -hmm. So um, I think most people kind of assume that or, or guess that was the ruling, but it's nice to have it in writing. Totally, totally. So there was only one other part of the rule book that stuck out to me, um, and that was the list of Winds of Exchange playtesters. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I saw a certain JT Russell and ST Russell. <laughs> well, if you're wondering why Winds of Exchange is so sloppy, no, look no further. <laughs> <laughs> why are there so many discard effects in Winds of Exchange? Uh, uh, every deck has this lazy Maverick auto encoder. What's going on? Oh, <laughs> uh, that's the card that I can't wait to get. Yeah, is that the uh, what is it? The old Tinker with the yep. Legacy Maverick auto encoder. Uh, I am super pumped for that. Um, but yeah, no, I I I will admit. Uh, uh, pridefully that i looked for look for our names in the first one first first uh rule book update that came out that was kind of woe related i was like yeah, i guess they didn't put us in but i don't know very i was very superficially uh involved so i, I was almost surprised that they they listed that afterwards but uh so yeah yeah so you got all this uh insider information that you can't share with anyone uh i actually went back and reread the the NDA right before jumping on here to make sure I didn't say anything I wasn't <laughs> supposed to. But hey, it's with FFG, not Ghost Galaxy. So like all bets are off. I don't know. Um, uh, uh, well, FFG is, is still an entity. 
So okay, okay. Well, I'll... I'm I'm not a I'm not a lawyer. We have a different uh, legal counsel, as they prefer to be called, mm-hmm. on our on our team. So I gave I, talk to them. I gave him stickers. They were accepted. Uh, so as far as I'm concerned, it's lawyer. It's official. Uh, but no, no, the bribe I'm... has been accepted. Bribe has been accepted. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I I think I I may still. I think I can say this as a little bit of a teaser. But I think I still have more. Um, alpha winds of exchange decks than mass mutation decks fun fact yeah wait what do you mean by alpha like from early early play testing early play testing oh wow yeah. Yeah. you've actually like printed decks of it mm-hmm mm-hmm they're like the cards were the same can't say quality. anymore i can't say anymore no 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 <laughs> oh no check no, the no. nda like, check the nda yeah no like print and play stuff print and play stuff okay yeah very cool yeah neat that's a really cool thing to treasure and have for the mm-hmm. rest of uh the rest of time uh and actually i i play star wars ccg as i've mentioned a few times a game that was originally made in the 90s and um a lot of certain like behind the scenes play testing things have hit the market recently and they are extraordinarily valuable even the ones that are just a piece of paper printed out hmm. so just wait 25 30 years never know we'll see i mean the I, I for a long time followed the magic designers um, and they're constantly reusing ideas from decades ago. You know, it's like, it just wasn't the right time and, and now it's the right time. So, I mean, you never know when cool. some of this stuff comes, comes around too. So, yeah, but yeah, fun nod, fun, fun nod. Very cool. Yeah. That's, that's very nice. Um, we, I was looking for uh Beehawk's name actually, cause I knew Beehawk was previously a play tester mm-hmm. um, and found their name. Only under older sets, not under Winds of Exchange. So <laughs> after Dark Tidings, they're like, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's the one, the one misfit on our team that does not appreciate Dark Tidings to its fullest. We, but we still love it. We we celebrate our diversity. We cannot be all DT fans, you know. <laughs> we can't all be perfect. We can't all be perfect, you know. We need we need that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. That was the last thing I found in the rule book. I don't know if you had time to kind of pour through it and find anything else that I missed. Yeah, no, I think there are, there were the highlights that I had you you hit on there, so it was good. I was most most intrigued as I'm sure most of the folks were by some of the stuff in the tournament rules and guidelines, so I think it makes sense to kind of jump in there and we'll we'll still save yeah. the goodness for the end, but we're building up to it. Yeah. 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 Um so there were some I have about five different changes in here that I, I thought were significant changes uh, at least in in some nature um the first one is about uh tournaments um where you have like a, a top cut um the final match of the tournament is best of three even if the rest of it is single elimination bracket or um, best of one the final will be a best of three and the finals also untimed which i thought was probably a good thing um it would probably feel pretty bad to get to the final and then lose on tiebreaker rules so mm-hmm. um I, I do like that change yeah, I think they they kind of realize that the tiebreaker rules, the tiebreaker, the story around tiebreakers is not great, uh, and so like, hey, yeah, let's not have that be the 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 walk off, the sign off for like a streamed finals match or something. Feels good. Yeah, it feels good. Yeah, yeah, um, and they did update the going to time rules, or at least they clarified them a little bit. Um, I, I couldn't tell if it was different, um, but in addition to the untimed final match being best of three, um, it looks like the only thing they added, if, it, if you just go by like the colored font, is in step three of when time is called for the round, um, player one starts their final turn, uh, and this is after, like, so if you and I are playing, time is called during your turn, you're player one. Um, you finish your turn just as you normally would, I take a full turn just as I normally would, and then the third step, it goes back to you again, and you only proceed until the step one forge a key, and then your turn ends, is what it says. And I think that's functionally the same thing, but they just spelled it out. So like, you do get a chance to forge again, which I don't think I knew that about the timed rules. I don't think I knew that either. Uh, gosh, I, I guess I thought after that next turn, you go immediately to the tiebreaker forging of like, yeah, uh, yeah. So I did not did not know that, or or maybe it just had never come up. Come up. Yeah, I don't remember the last time I had a 
a timed game in a tournament come up. I mean, obviously it's been years since we've played I, uh, in real life tournaments, but gosh, the last the last vault tour I went to was in um was in Philly at Pax Unplugged. I forget the year, but there's probably only one year it could be. Um, but it was World Coll- Worlds Collide uh, sealed, and there was also an Archon. Uh, and yeah, I missed the top cut by uh, one amber in the final tiebreaker. <laughs> Bummer. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Um, online play, it's a little bit harder to get to the tiebreakers just because TCO moves a lot quicker than mm-hmm. in person. But I have indeed had a one and a half hour Kagi game this season. So uh, we, we just went untimed and it just kept going. So, um, I mean, I don't even know what would have happened had we just played with the timer that game. But uh, now it's a, a memorable, long, I think it was 44 turn game. So, um, all right. So those are the first two um, untimed finals and then going to time tiebreakers. Um, third one we're going to go over quickly, Alliance Restricted List. Do you want to talk about this? We're just going to ignore it. Nope. <laughs> I, th- I think the changes make sense. I I don't yeah. have I don't have enough enough uh, insight into the format to yeah. to say much beyond that. I suppose. But, yeah. But the thing they is, they change. Yeah. Yeah. They added control the weak, scrambler storm, and stealth mode to the restricted list. Um, mm-hmm. And I think it said in in any quantity. So like you could have a deck with three control the weak still. Right. Um, but I don't believe you could have a deck with control the weak and scrambler storm. Right. So these are the ones that are like. Hey, you can't have multiple things on the list, but you can have them in any quantity. Um, and then, of yeah. course, if your deck, well, all the usual rules apply. But these are not the ones that are like uh, uh, can't mix in or can't have more than one. These are the can't have them alongside any of the others. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think that actually throws out the one um, uh, alliance deck that I made and played against you since it has Scrambler Storm and Library Access. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I wouldn't be able to play that one anymore. They finally got gotcha. you. They finally got gotcha. you. <laughs> they I were mean, watching that they're stream. Still, still playing, maybe they were, for all we know. <laughs> uh, but the Scrambler Storm was like not even a big deal in that one. It, it doesn't take away the OTK, which is fueled by Library Access, Phase Shift, Battlefleet, Key Abduction. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, this is this to me feels like, like hey, like, lockout combo or lockout control or, or whatever, whatever, yeah. whatever you, whatever you have is, is a thing like let's clamp down on this uh, because the forex stealth mode pods are kind of silly. The forex scrambler storm pods are kind of silly. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I don't have anything insightful to say about Alliance either. Um, mm-hmm. It's just, this does not affect my feelings on it. <laughs> it's not going to change whether or not I want to play it. Um, you know, I just support the news. That's all. <laughs> for, for this one, for this one week, week thirty-six, we're reporting the news. Although we'll be episode yes. thirty-five, so oh no, yes. Oh, this podcast will, numbering is going to get messed up is, if we do it out of order. This is recording thirty-six, but we'll be episode thirty-five. Yeah. Okay, that's not confusing for anyone at I think, all. Yeah, stream thirty-six. Um, <laughs> it is. Yeah. Um. All right, so there's one more before we get to the big one. Um, and the one more that this is actually really interesting to me is about foreign language cards. Mm-hmm. Um, they talk in the tournament guide about English is always considered a standard language in whatever tournament you're playing in. Um, but wherever, like whoever's running the event, they can determine what the standard languages are um, to be played. And if you are not playing a deck with a standard language for that event, you must provide your opponent with a list printed in a language of the event. So either in English or in whatever language is standard. So if I go to a local here uh, in, in the US where it's just English and I bring a French deck, I will need to bring an, an English translation of that French deck, of the list, not the whole deck. Um, and it also clarified that the master vault can only be used by the event staff if they need to check a translation or check a card. And that's the part that stuck out to me because I believe previously you were allowed to use the Master Vault to look at your opponent's translated list, their mm-hmm. their foreign deck list. Mm-hmm. And the when the Master Vault was recently updated to give enhancement data, 
I was actually concerned that, okay, bringing a foreign deck is at a disadvantage now because your opponent will then see all of your enhancements and you're not allowed to see theirs if they bring an English deck. So this actually remedies that problem. So I'm, I'm pretty happy about that. Um, it does mean that you need to trust your opponent in them bringing like a, a translated deck list for you. Um, I don't know how they plan on generating that. Like there are some tools that like Sky Jedi has made one before that um, you can basically like create the image of an Archon card. Um, and I've actually printed those before for some of my foreign decks. Mm. Um, I hope like that's like a more readily available option for stuff like this. Um, I don't really want someone to bring a piece of paper with like 36 cards written down on it. <laughs> yeah, deck registration. Just bring, getting flashbacks to deck registration sheets that I filled out. Uh, there was a time when I like printed out my deck registration sheets for constructed type games to like mm -hmm. people be scribbling. And I'm just like, all right, hand it in, go sit down. Yep. <laughs> you, you it's know. like a in other games, it's like a a ritual of like who has the worst handwriting in yeah, these things and yeah. you can't figure out what they are um the most infamous story that uh i remember from star wars ccg is uh someone actually wrote their entire deck list on the back of a pizza box oh, and handed in the pizza box oh, and geez. i guess there was nothing in the rules that prevented that at the time so <laughs> So now I don't Star want. Wars I don't want to get there. Says no pizza boxes, please. <laughs> <laughs> now it's in the rules. Apparently, I don't know. I just don't want to get there with Keyforge. I don't want to. I don't want to get a pizza box. And, so, uh, so here's something really cool, though. I mean, the printing technology that that uh, Ghost Galaxy has available to them, I think, actually opens up some really cool potential for semi-official proxies. I don't know if they ever want to go down that road, um, but you know, when you go to play a say draft on the magic pro tour you open cards they're not okay they're not proxies printed for that event but they're stamped for that event um that's more of an anti-cheating measure right but um you could imagine proxies that ghost galaxy prints that have a stamp for a vault tour and you pay like five bucks because like hey can you please print me a copy of my deck uh in a, in a standard language and they're like yeah sure but it's gonna be like all the cards are stamped so that's kind of like a generic card but maybe stamped so that it's got you know in lieu of an archon name right you have to have like some sort of mark that it pulls them together and then they're not legal for any kind of other event i don't know uh, just just kind of an idea that, that came up but like that could be cool you're talking like printing an entire deck yeah basically yeah, basically that would um, be a lot it would be a lot it would be a lot they print a lot of decks i don't know yeah. Um, I mean, I think a lot of people would pay way more than $5 for that. It's basically well, just being able to print a proxy deck. Well, sure. And here's the thing too. I mean, if you're, if you're not customizing, then maybe you have a stamp for your event. Maybe you have a stamp for enhancements that need to be applied. And then it's not like you're printing, you're doing custom printing, right? Cause you just print generic versions, you know, a thousand generic of every, of every common. And then it's stamped for the event stamped if it's enhanced, you know, or, so, or something. Um, yeah. so, so I think there's, yeah. And I agree with you too. People would, would pay good money for it. Um, but it maybe also solves that problem and also gives you kind of a unique thing. Like people, people do collect like pro tour stamped cards. Um, because why not? You know, hmm. Hmm. we'll see. Yeah. We'll see how, uh, how people, um, try to break this you never know yeah <laughs> um i don't think it'd be that bad uh but it, i do like the change in general to the foreign language rules um i like that they no longer have a disadvantage of being able to use the master vault for enhancements um so that's a good fix two thumbs up for that one <laughs> yeah right on all right um the last one is the big one and we're going to spend a little bit more time on this one. And this is what I think a lot of people have been talking about today. And this is regarding the visibility of deck lists in Archon games. So um, real quick, Sealed, they officially went back to the former format of in Sealed, you cannot see your opponent's deck list. I didn't know they ever moved away from that, to be honest <laughs> with you. Um, so in Sealed games, you still cannot see your opponent's list throughout the game. But Archon and in Alliance Standard, you are allowed at any point in the game to look at your opponent's Archon now. So that is a functional change to how competitive play has always been done in real life. Mm -hmm. You know, used to just get two minutes at the start, and that's it. Game of memory. If you remember it, you, or you have to kind of train yourself to look for certain things. And now you have the information available to you throughout 
the game. So a lot to unpack on that one. Um, yeah. What's what's your gut feeling on that change? Uh, I mean, my my gut feeling is a little bit mixed, uh, and probably not in, not in, in no small part colored by the last however many years of playing on TCO. Like, I think if you had if you had said that we're doing this before pandemic times, I would have said, oh gosh, that's this terrible idea. You know, like you're, you're kind of ruin, ruining the game. But I've been maybe a little bit desensitized to having the Archon card available. Uh, at all times um, I've also kind of wavered on how much I think the game ought to be testing you on your ability to memorize uh, the um, the Archon card but the far and away biggest concern I have with it uh, like I think I think there's a whole lot of really good things that come with it the only the only real concern if you want to call it that is the potential to, for for slow play and, and slowing the games down um, so I think that's the thing that is worth considering um and kind of where my thought process starts for unpacking the change uh, what's your what's your kind of immediate reaction yeah that's my only worry my only concern is about the slow playing but you're you know if players are going to slow play they can find a way to slow play so mm. I, I don't think that um creating another possibility of that is going to break anything necessarily i think the vast majority of players in this game are very sportsmanlike and i think I, I don't think it's going to make a major negative impact. That said, like there's going to be that time when it does, and that's going to bring this under scrutiny again at that time. But I think this is, I think this is probably fine from that perspective. Um, Second Act made a point earlier today on one of the Discord servers that they felt that um, this was kind of taking away a skill testing part of KeyForge. Mm -hmm. um, it kind of is. Um, I, I definitely. I learned a lot and had a lot of pride in like figuring out the important takeaways in an Archon card. And, and we did an episode on memory a couple months ago mm -hmm. and um, tried to kind of introduce some strategies for how you could get better at memorizing a list in two minutes. And so that's kind of gone now. I mean, I had, I'd never taken advantage of that fully. Um, in theory, I kind of liked it. Maybe, you know, as we're getting closer to in-person events, maybe I'd start practicing that again. Um, and practicing is the key word there. It's like, I, I don't believe that some people have better memory than others. And, you know, like there are people that are at like just inherent advantages with that. I do think that's something that most people will be able, would be able to learn um, some easier than others for sure. But even if you can't memorize it all, I still found value in um, kind of understanding a set and the houses and the meta and recognizing like, okay, um, you have a, a Coda deck with untamed logos and sanctum. So you, you're scaling Amber control. You might have, graft principle and doorstep mm -hmm. and just like being able to recognize that right away i think is less relevant now because you can use that time to look at other parts of their list and if you ever are concerned about like oh do they have a graft you could just reach across the table grab it and and do it that way so um it, there is something that's being lost i think in the game a little bit but that said i don't hate this change like it's it's logical um i think the point that I made earlier to you is that we've been playing online for three years now, which is over half the existence of this game. Mm -hmm. And so if you put it in that perspective, like this change is really just making it in line with how Keyforge has been played for the longest part of its history. So do you think some of their motivation for this change was like, hey, we don't want to like shock players when they go back to in-person after having gotten used to having access to the Archon card for the entire game. I mean, you think that factored in? Uh, uh, maybe. Like, you're asking, like, did Ghost Galaxy consider how the game's played on TCO with regards to how they changed the rules? And yeah. I think it's possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think there's other reasons to do it. I don't think it's really just a matter of, um, you know, matching up with the online experience. I, I do think that there, there's other positives to it as well. Like, you know, maybe they didn't value that memorization step as much as FFG did originally. So, you know, um, I, I, there are some people that are rejoicing. Others are very upset about it, very sad about it. I'm kind of, I think with you, like in the middle, like, you know, it, you win some, you lose some, there's some pros and cons to it. I don't feel super strongly about it either way. Yeah. Yeah. I, I we'll see how it nets out kind of on the uh, rules enforcement, slow play enforcement front, or if it becomes problematic. 
uh, I do want to dig into that a little bit more, but I guess f- before we get there, I w- I'm curious, like, who do you think that this benefits the most, right? Like I know, I know second act I've played with him many times in person and online <laughs> more, more online than in person, <laughs> embarrassingly enough, <laughs> since we hail the same LGS. Um, but he is a person who has uh, a tremendous ability to, I don't know if I don't necessarily memorize an Archon card, but um, but interpret a situation and use his knowledge of the or use those two minutes to uh, to really kind of like inform the rest of his play, right? So I think he is a person who I'm not going to say lost lost an edge, but uh, was was really good at uh, playing the game in that two minute kind of. Uh, uh, window for analysis, you know, we utilizing that two minute window and just knowing the game so well and kind of being able to, being able to make his decisions uh, based on that. And, uh, I don't know if it, if it kind of, uh, well, I don't know how, how, where, how to, how to phrase it, phrase it so much, but I feel like it almost feels like when you have that, that skill, it almost feels like, uh, folks got an unfair leg up when you're kind of saying like, okay, there's this thing that I've learned to utilize. It's been part of the rules and now you get it for free, but I've spent time kind of investing, uh, investing to kind of like, um, yeah. really make the most of it. And, uh, and that I can see kind of feels not great. Um, and, and is, is fair. Uh, is fair. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, I think it does hurt some of the people who are very competitive and devoted a lot of time to it. Like you said, um, I know a few people that used to play and still play who like really took this part of the game seriously and they they trained themselves to get better at at memorizing that um and now they no longer have that advantage and i think those people are limited to like some of the very best players that Mm. used to have this advantage that are great players regardless and they had this extra advantage from this um through their own skill and work and dedication um and they are i think losing a little bit of their advantage in that regard And, you know, the flip side to me really is there was a comparison of, you know, are we moving closer to war than than the skill testing game? And it's kind of like who can flip the card and, and read the deck list. Um, and I mean, there's there's the counter action. There's the, the counter argument, which is, you know, I don't think we lost any, like no information that was hidden is becoming not hidden. And you haven't really kind of taken a step closer towards information parity. Um, so I, I don't know if war is a better example. I'd say we're probably moving closer to chess. Um, like in chess, you know, there's no hidden information at all. You don't have a hand. You don't get to strategize with information that your opponent doesn't have access to. And yet it's, I, I think, considered a, a very skill testing game, if not just for the memory component of, uh, of, well, of learning some of these openings and such. But even in the mid game where you're past any preparation you might have done, being able to reason through the position and and work out and work through the potential outcomes isn't necessarily a, a memory uh, uh, test, as it were, um, but is uh, is very testing in itself, um, and that is with with no kind of uh, information being hidden. Uh, so I don't know. I I don't worry about it a ton. I think there's still a lot of room for you to outplay your opponent for you to mm-hmm. take advantage of the information disparity and for you to, I mean, look at the past three years of online play, right? It's, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I think that we've seen it play out. Um, so hopefully that, hopefully that carries through. Yeah. There are different kinds of skills too, like the memorization skill and, you know, like the in-game skill. Um, there's still plenty of skill in this game. It's just that one type of it is no longer as important um if you spend less time reaching across the table during the game because you already know what's in there you might have more time to strategize what you're doing in your game anyway um but you also still do need to memorize you know the card pool um Mm. so that if you look at a list you know what the cards do that's not gone so like there's still that part of it too so it's not like it's not fundamentally changing the game it's just a tweak to make it a little bit you know simpler and more logical i think so in uh in a setting where you have a stronger player versus a newer player right i i would say this almost benefits the stronger player more right because you're going to especially if you're in a situation where 
one person is going to look at that list and not recognize or not recognize every card on it right yeah. like like then yeah. the person who's reading the list just has all the information available to them that have, and and they've kind of gained nothing i don't know for reference it's interesting you mentioned that um so my one friend i'm teaching is actually my brother's girlfriend teaching mm -hmm. how to play keyforge i've tried to teach my brother lost cause doesn't want to do it uh, he's not into it and the reason he says he's not into it is because it takes that a lot of time to kind of ramp up and understand the card pool and memorize all the cards and even if he could look at a list you know it takes a long time to get to the point where you can interpret that and understand what that means like mm -hmm. which cards are creature control which cards are amber control um and that kind of thing and he just said he's not really interested in that um that investment to do that but mm -hmm. you're you're totally right that if you're playing as a new player and i know what all the cards do and i have constant access to your archon card i'm always going to know what the possibilities are they still don't know what any of the cards do. <laughs> they're they're going to be at a massive disadvantage, and I don't know if there's like a a remedy for that. It's you know maybe it's the chain handicapping that we talked about earlier, but um, you know I, this does kind of affect that a bit. But if you're you know having a new player versus an experienced player, it's not really in a competitive environment anyway. So I don't think it's you know that impactful as, with regards to tournaments. Yeah, and that's fair, and and we do have. Uh, certainly a lean towards the competitive audience here, I think. Uh, so that's fair. Um, I... Ah, not sure where I was going, so I'll cut that out. And we'll move on. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, the other question I had, I guess for you is, you know, what what is slow play in your mind? We we talked for, we've talked for an hour or so now. Uh, we went through the updates to the to the rules books, the turn tournament rules and the, and the guidelines. And I had to go back through. This is one thing I did look for, and I don't think it's actually in there. I don't think we have a definition for slow play in the tournament rules and guidelines. Um, I yeah, think it is says... There, is there stalling or anything like that? I, I didn't turn anything up. You know, it says this is kind of unsporting conduct, uh, intentional yeah. slow play, but there's no sort of like, well, okay, but what is slow play? Uh, you know, uh, it's kind of left left to the discretion of the reader a little bit. Um, uh, I think from a, um, magic standpoint, um, like certainly you can get complex board states and someone coming over might take a, a fair bit of time to kind of look at this board state and figure out what's going on and what some optimal plays are. But you as the player are experiencing, experiencing it build over time. And, and the tactic there is kind of like, well, you the 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 you're playing slowly too slowly and the judge's judge's perspective if you know the incremental change is disproportionate to the amount of time you're taking to consider it so it's not like oh gosh look at this crazy board and let me synthesize everything it's like no the board's more or less the same as it was last turn um this thing changed now you can now you have a reasonable amount of time to incorporate that um and i don't know if that if that changes a whole lot with having decklist visible because at the worry right is like i'm gonna every turn just be like well okay let me see your decklist let me see your discard pile cross reference everything and mm -hmm. like that's not a valid activity for you to be doing like okay maybe if you can always see their decklist and you're keeping mental track of the cards that were played last turn you should be you can be uh i don't know on the hook for ticking those off and there's almost a larger mental like burden <laughs> or 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 way that uh, for someone with a Herculean memory to take advantage of that information. But certainly I think having uh, someone kind of cross-referencing referencing those routinely is is not going to fly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, can they spell out maybe like how many times you're allowed to ask for the Archon or ask for their discard pile? Like, I don't know. Like that might be getting a little bit too nitty gritty, and you have like a, a counter next to you, and be like, "Oh, it's your third time you've asked for my discard pile. You can't ask for it again," or something like that. Mm. Um, another suggestion I saw someone throw out on Discord today was only allow players to look at Archon cards after a key is flipped. Hmm. And so you have like this specific time window during the game where you're allowed to to do something like that again. Um, and that doesn't that means that like if you're getting to the end of the game and you're both grinding for key three, you can't just sit there and look at their Archon card for five minutes as you realize that oh I have all the capture, I can win this into time rules and Yeah. Just move on. 
Yeah, it's an interesting idea. Uh, I feel like if there's if there's a, a window set aside for doing it, that I'm going to feel compelled to use the entire window, you know. Uh, and maybe now it's if it's an extra minute, well, I'm tacking six minutes on to every or three minutes on to every game. If it's one sided, um, four minutes, I guess you don't need to reference it after key three. But um, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, we'll see. Uh, I guess question for you, uh, quick draw. Have you ever called somebody on slow play? Have you ever been like, Hey judge, this person's slow playing me, um, um, sort them out, please. I have not had to call a judge for that ever in any of my gaming career. I did have to tell a, an opponent who was in a different game that was newer or returning. They weren't as like, you know, knowledgeable about the game and the situation. In a tournament, I, I said you need to play faster because, like, they were they were literally asking me what they should do, like every turn. <laughs> I was like, I can't, I can't tell you, and you need to play faster because, like, it just it wasn't enough, and and they understood, and they, you know, they started moving faster. I didn't have to call a judge, hmm. but it is hard. It's it's an awkward situation. Um, I've seen it happen a lot in tournaments to other players, and it's always a judgment call. And like the one issue that I've seen happen is like you get to the end of the game and time is called and then someone says, Hey, look, my opponent like stalled this entire game. And they're like, well, you should have said something sooner. Like we can't do anything about it now. Yeah. And so it's this awkward situation of like, how soon is too soon to call a judge over for slow play. And what does that do to like your reputation as an opponent who's going to like start calling judge for, you know, someone wants to properly think about their turn. Is that unsporting conduct in itself to say like, calling a judge for slow play when they're really just taking a normal time to think about a turn, you know, like we're allowed to think, you know, like my favorite thing, like when in TCO is when someone says like thinking and the other person <laughs> responds, like I'll allow it. Like it, it's, it's a hard game, you know, like you should be allowed to think. And um, I, I don't love the idea that you can like pressure your opponent into not thinking as much mm -hmm. by calling over a judge. Yeah. Yeah. I will say, I, I have called judges over to watch for slow play uh, and it does not feel good. Like, like I think you have to be like very comfortable with your yourself. <laughs> like, and, yeah. and like a newer player is not going to be like, uh, maybe they, maybe they will, but uh, it, it's, it's, it's a hurdle. It's a hurdle to clear, to feel comfortable calling a judge over to watch for slow play. And, and the time when it's critical to do so is probably earlier than you know earlier than like you're you know the, like, like what you're saying it comes a point where it's too late and the window's closed and yeah and you needed to do it before and now you're just kicking yourself um and and the, and the problem yeah. is that it's a gray area it's not yeah. like you you need to do it by the 30 minute mark it's like it, you just don't know like there's no rule for it yep and so i think that's my only hang up if you want to call it that right uh I think it's a, I think it's a great change logistically. I think it solves the like, well, are we, are we testing memory or not? The two minute thing is kind of awkward. Okay. We're, we're just not, that's cool. Great. Like, like let's move forward. Um, uh, but I, I don't think that, Hey, if people abuse it, just call a judge for slow play is necessarily a full picture for the solution. Or at least there is a lot that has to like go along with that to, I don't know for perception or training or, or I don't even know what, but like the people, the number of times that people are actually going to call a judge for over to watch for slow play is, is not large, not large. And yeah. when it does happen, it's probably not going to be uh, timely. Yeah. Yeah. Most of the time you can't do anything about it. So Most of the time you can't do it it's about it. tough situation. Um, do we dare bring up the C word or maybe the CC words? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm going to bring it up. Um, I don't think it's a. I don't think it's something we're gonna dive into right now. But I would like to talk about uh, chess clocks or keyforge clocks at some point. I don't know. Maybe we have a community member or two who is really interested and passionate about this topic and feels like yeah, we could have a, a reasonable uh, 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 debate on the merits or demerits of using. Emphasis this is on reasonable. <laughs> Uh, tell us what you really think quick draw <laughs> <laughs> i don't know i i missed a lot of that original conversation but i know it's a, a difficult sort of taboo subject in the game but i do think keyforge is uniquely designed 
in a way that just is begging for chess clocks to be used. Mm -hmm. um, every other CCG, every player gets the opportunity to interrupt actions, to respond to actions. Keyforge is just straight up like, it's my turn. I do everything. You have no say during this turn. And for that reason, it's like, how do we not using a chess clock if we're going to have time games? You know, like it's very clear cut. Yeah, it does feel it does feel like it was almost designed for them to be used. Certainly designed to be played in a digital environment where you could like put your phone down and go. I don't know, do whatever until it's your turn again, right? Because you can mm -hmm. you can more or less just put it down, read the log, and be be all caught up. Um, while your opponent's sitting there asking for manual mode. <laughs> How about this one? You're allowed to look at your opponent's Archon card, but only during their turn. Only during their turn. That's see, that's cool. That's a cool idea. So if they want to take away your ability to read your Archon card some more, play mm -hmm. faster. Mm -hmm. uh, the only other, the only other kind of weirdness with that is, do you need to be like, and then I shuffled my deck, and this was every card in my discard pile. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, that is, that was a problem in TCO in the past when you would like play punctuated or just mm -hmm. like end your turn real quick and you didn't even have a chance to look at the discard pile, which is public information. Um, so yeah, I think you still have to do something about that anyway. Like someone could play their turn fast and not even offer to show you the discard mm -hmm. before they like end their turn and shuffle. Yeah. You can still do that now. You can but... still do that now. Um, yeah, yeah. What are you gonna do? What are you gonna yeah. do? I, the most awkward thing about a chess clock is uh, 22 and a half minutes. 22 and a half minutes. Such a weird, weird number. You know, like it's not something that's like 30 minutes if you're playing a 60 minute game or mm. even 20 minutes if you're playing a 40, but it's 45. So it has to be 22 and a half. And that just feels a little weird. It's a little weird. Maybe we would do 22. I think 22 and a half minutes is pretty, is pretty generous, pretty luxurious. Um, yeah, but maybe that's by playing online standards. Uh, yeah, certainly by playing online standards. I do think that I'm generally a faster player. Um, in in person games, I, I've rarely had go to time. Um, mass mutation though definitely changed that. Um, playing more sanctum and sorry index. Those ones. And those ones know how to grind. They know how to grind, and there's there is a decent amount of of bookkeeping to be done. Uh, uh, like tokens are interesting uh, they're less fiddly than like in raging wards um but worlds collide for a while i was there like hey hey folks like okay we don't need a new token we don't need a new token let's let's kind of hone it in um yeah so it's fair um yeah cool all right all right yeah that was all i had from the tournament guide um and that was the big one obviously um I think we touched on everything that I wanted to talk about with it. I'm sure it's going to be a pretty hot topic over the next week or so um, as people are kind of adjusting and preparing for, you know, in real life play again and, and how this might change their mindset for it. But um, I, there's some big changes came out today and I think it's pretty exciting to get to talk about this. Yeah. Right on, right on. So hopefully folks appreciated this, uh, these hot takes hot off the pro sloppy presses. Uh, <laughs> And we'll be uh, around in, in those conversations too, I'm sure. So looking forward to that. Um, why don't we wrap things up here and then we'll transition to playing a game. Does that sound good? Yeah, sounds great. Cool. So uh, uh, folks who are interested in hanging out with us live for uh, recordings of Bottom of the Beaker, that happens Tuesdays at 9.30 Eastern. Every Tuesday at 9.30 Eastern right here on twitch.tv slash sloppy lab work. You can find recordings of our past shows and archives of our other streams over at youtube.com. Search for at sloppy lab work. And uh, for the very best content, 34? No, 57 times distilled and then <laughs> scraped from the bottom of the beaker. Search for that very phrase in your podcatcher of choice and you'll find us there. Giving you a nice little wave. Um, yeah. Anything else for the folks getting off of the last audio stop, quick draw? Just thanks for listening and stay sloppy. Stay sloppy indeed. Okay, cool. I'm going to end our audio recording. Very good. Very good. Adjust the old layout in OBS. So we talked uh, before about what 
kind of game we're going to play. We usually like to play a game that's like similar to the topic at hand. And we didn't really have anything that was like, we didn't want to play a slow play game. Like, uh, <laughs> let's go to time and see how this goes because it's late at night. Um, so what we ended up deciding on, which I like, is uh, we've talked before about our little intra-team league that we have, the Sloppy Sextet League. Mm-hmm. Um, we've each opened six decks sealed. I have three of them assigned to a... Um, uh, what is it called? Three Fates? I'm forgetting. So there's Seal Triad, Three Fates, and then... Seal Triad, that's it. Yeah. And then, uh, so the Seal Triad, one of the decks is banned. That deck becomes an adaptive best of three deck. And then you play a Three Fates. Um, you and I are paired up in our little team tournament right now. This is mm-hmm. round three. We are the two undefeateds on our team. Uh, well, in the event. Um, which only features <laughs> sloppy lab workers. <laughs> um, so Calvin Ball with Keyforge. <laughs> I like that. Um, so you and I are paired up, and we decided let's just play our game on stream tonight. Um, and this is the adaptive best of three round. Mm-hmm. And per our new rules recommendations, how many chains should we give you? Oh, for being the better player? <laughs> um, I feel like since... Let's let's just take the number of wins that you have minus the number of wins I have, and whoever has more gets that many chains. Oh, Although, dear. I don't know if that'll work because the rulebook specifically says that you cannot have more than twenty-four chains. <laughs> so we'll just give you twenty. We'll give you twenty-four. Twenty-four chains. Four chains. Auto first bid. Oh dang! I like that. I like that. Uh, well, we are playing a best of three, so the first game is going to be um, just a regular Archon game. Yeah, so so the folks in the uh, stream here tonight get some extra content. Two games instead of one. Maybe three if we're <laughs> up for it. <laughs> if one of us manages to blow it. So the other thing about this is that um, have you played? You haven't played a game with this deck, right? Nope, nope. First time. Okay, you haven't tryharded with it. I have no, no. Uh, I think. Uh, well, I guess we didn't set ground rules, but. Uh, there are some there are some sloppy sex deck ground rules. Points of honor more really than hard and fast yeah. rules, right? Like we say, don't look yeah. at the don't look at the decks of Keyforge page uh, for before you assign your decks to the various formats, and yeah, don't really do any practice games. Uh, yeah, yeah, I got mine right here. There you go, uh, Roscom of mm, War Park looks like, looks like some AOA right there. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, that's that's actually a good thing to note too. So. Yeah. typically typically for these games uh there is set parity so folks would open um uh, the same sets and then maybe if you did like a two 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 you'd say like well we've got to assign one deck from each set uh to the triad and then to this to the three fates lineups right um but we didn't do that did we do that so tell us tell us what sets you are playing with in your pool so um i have my six decks let me see if i find them yeah, so I have um, three from Mass Mutation, three from AOA. Um, now, originally, not tonight, said that if I played six Mass Mutation, then I would be a coward. <laughs> and so um, I thought that by playing three and three, I was okay. But then she's like, no, you're still a coward. So um, I'm a coward because I have Mass Mutation decks at all. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is interesting, my my split, I, I did look at the Saz after where I assigned them and I've played a few of the matches now. I do have a truly terrible deck for reversal, which I <laughs> properly chose for reversal last round. Nice. Um, truly terrible deck. Okay. Okay. And, and these are, so of our six decks, these are the decks that were banned from our triad, right? So we're playing the adaptive best of three with the banned decks from yeah. our triad. Yeah, okay. and it, important note, the triad was sealed triad. So you're not looking at the list and banning. We look at the houses and the set to right. make the ban. So we're both playing these these decks that were um, uh, originally chosen. Uh, so the list are, oh, you, you didn't, oh, the no. list are open in this. Okay. Yeah, lists are open in this one. Uh, so you're okay, playing good. a mass mutation thing. You've got double mark of this. Oof. Orb of Nvidia, Obsidian Forge, nice. Universal mm-hmm. Key Lock, Lethologica. Okay, some cool stuff. Transporter Platform, Quixel Stone, Double mm-hmm. s- Double Stunner. Oh my goodness, this is nonsense. Mm-hmm. 
Okay. Uh, it, yeah, it's it's kind of nonsense. So you've got uh, a, an AOA deck. You've got a double Dremonaut with a Ganger Chieftain. Two Binding Irons, like the Doom. Mm -hmm. Two Tezmal, very nice. Uh, unlock Gateway, so you do have a wipe. Uh, they're everywhere with Save the Pack, which is like a DIY wipe, as I like to call it. Mm -hmm. uh, Keat Charge and Chota, nice. Um, Coward's End, lots of creature control. Okay. And a Lash of Broken Dreams, just for good measure. So, just for good measure. Um, very, it looks like a very good AOA deck, I would say. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if it was the best in my pool, but I, I opened six AOA decks for my pool, so very much not a coward. Uh, and still looking for my first game loss, quick draw, game loss in uh, in this league. So let's see. Um, <laughs> let's see here. If I'm counting correctly, uh, I'm only counting nine pips in this deck, maybe 10. Maybe 10. So not a ton, um, but mm -hmm. a, a good deck. This should be an interesting match. We'll see. We'll see. You got some scary things. You got some scary things I don't really want to see. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I'm going to keep this. I'm keeping um, as well. Start with a bot book den. A bot book den. Okay, cool. <clears throat> mm -hmm. See if maybe you want to waste the board wipe on a bot book den. Nah, but I'm going to stun it with this one two punch. Play this bingle, play a ganger chieftain. I'm not gonna fight because I want a smith. Yeah. Good smith. Good smith. Um, oh, and uh, I, I, there are some folks out there. I, it has come to my attention that um, that listen to our games as opposed to watch them streaming. So uh, was mm -hmm. was asked to uh, to narrate and commentate as we go. Oh my. Okay. Uh, so I've got two Infomorphs, one with the draw pip and a Forge compiler. Remove the sun from the booked in. So uh, build up some mutants here and then uh, pass the turn. Very nice. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go back into Brobnar, uh, playing out some blood money on one of your Infomorphs. Very good. Uh, Bingle fights in. Mm hmm. And we're just going to do that. Discard my coward's Solid. end. Clear your board. All right. Very good. Um, go dis. Play the obsidian forge. Seems good. Play. Let's see here. Yeah, I wish that your ganger chieftain was not damaged. Yeah, this alas. was a, uh, this was a, like, don't get mark of dist attack. Yep. Very smart. <laughs> Uh, I am gonna go for some pips here since I don't. I think you have too much creature control for me to actually account for all of it. Um, I will kill the Ganger Chieftain and play out a Drecker. Ooh, Drecker is nice. Okay, well that's one mark of dis down. Uh, I am gonna go dis as well. Uh, Play and not finish with you. Shuffle back the Ganger Chieftain. We'll see if I regret that later. Right. Um, play a Sad Schuler. Uh, play a Charette. Play a Tesmal and Old York. Pitch my, pitch my Fang House. Gonna draw into mm. some uh, better stuff maybe. Okay. Lots of creatures. Some dudes. Some dudes. Well, I definitely have to get rid of the Tesmal. Eh, you know. Eh. Um, <clears throat> awkward turn here. Um, if I fight with the Infernus, the Drekker will die. Which is probably okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, maybe. <clears throat> eh, maybe, okay. Let's find out. Um, I like that you don't have any R. That's pretty cool. Sag. Very Sag. Yeah, that's actually really good <laughs> that you don't have any R. <laughs> um, 
Good, but not for me. All right, let's use my board while I can. Let's reap to steal one. Mm -hmm. Let's fight into the charrette, get that amber back, and let's implode the Tesmol. Nice. And I'll end the turn with five. Pretty solid. Right back into this, playing Tesmol number two. Mm -hmm. Reap, reap to six, and pass. Okay. Um, all right, let's see what kind of amber control we're looking at here. You have the Blash, of course, which mm -hmm. you haven't found yet. Um, and I think that's it. Schuller and the Charette. Yeah, that's that's pretty much it. So I'm feeling pretty good about a, a little rush strategy here, um, which is going to include your survey. Card. Let's discard the Relentless Creeper. That's pretty convenient. Um, and the Quixel Stone. There it is. There it is. Cool. Hmm. <laughs> okay, now now thinky time. Um You played an awful lot of dis. You just went Star Alliance. What are the chances you got a big old hand of logos? Hmm? Hmm. Let's. I don't know. Let's find out. Let's find out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Old York's going to fight in. Mm -hmm. Stop some steals. We're going to reap. We're going to say uh, no logos from you. Mm -hmm. Reap to eight and pass. Okay. Uh, so the good thing is I drew a subject to Kirby, which is going to be pretty clutch right here. Nice. Um, especially with the Forge compiler. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Play out the stunner, and let's play out that guy. Okay, clears a Logos card out of hand, draws you something new. I'm going to push my luck, say dis again. Um, we're going to take this Kirby off the board with a double fight. Reap with the Tesmol, say Logos again, and end the turn. All right. And really hoping it's getting awkward and cluttered in the hand over there. Back into Star. Mm-hmm. Plays the stealth stir. Ooh, awkward. A thing. Yeah. A thing. Well, stealth stir is not taking out Tesmol and doesn't fight well into Schuler. Let's keep it going. No logos and a reap. Okay, so. This is the TV they came for. <laughs> this is what this is what everyone came for. <laughs> this is the content. <laughs> Let's go dis. Mm-hmm. Play the creeper. Cool. Draws a card. Very nice. Ooh. Very cool obsidian forge usage. Yeah, let's see who I want to get rid of here. Mm -hmm. And then let's go. Let's go with the Brabble. Place the Brabble, nice. Mm. Hmm. Interesting. I think I have to push.
push my luck here. Keep you in the corner for a little bit longer. Um, the relentless creeper is very clutch here. Yeah, I must say. that's really nice. Um, hmm. But do I? That it has a drop hip on it too, which is like has to be mentioned. That drop hip on that relentless creeper here might be saving me. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm wondering. Did you draw the brabble, or did you have the brabble in hand? Uh, I drew the brabble last turn. Oof. Okay. Okay. So, do I want this key f force you into a awkward dis turn? Doesn't seem that bad. Looking at your uh, board control situation too. I think we do it. I think we go back into dis. Uh, reap, stop the logos. Reap to seven. Okay, you're gonna let me have it. Yep. Yep. Yeah, maybe it would have been better to f fight. I thought you were going to fight one for sure. I wasn't sure if I Probably was just the... delay, like fight the fight the creeper, it bends it, and then you have to decide if you're going to fight the brabble. I guess you fight the brabble into Schuler, take me off check, and then I get to go back into dis. Yeah. Maybe. I do wish time. that I could. Uh... Ooh, that's nice. All right, that's a key, though. I'll take it. Um. Ooh. So I'm making a key now. Decisions. I think we are going to go into Untamed here. Play this Rusnar, the sneaky Rusnar. Discard our key charge and discard our Choda. Not yep. sad about that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's go Logos. Play the Qmax. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna play the diametric charge. Oh, nice! Purge the drum or not? Okay. Yeah, okay. that's not that big of a loss for you, actually. Could be worse. Yeah. For sure. I mean, considering uh, you can't really play any creatures, so. There is that. There is that. I was looking forward to discarding that drum or not. <laughs> well, now you can't do it. Uh -huh. Um, this is, I guess, kind of a risky Lethologica. I lost the mark of Dis. Not sad about um, that. Yeah. But that's the only real loss. I, I kind of am okay to get through my creatures here, find some more pips. Um, I think the pips are how I'm going to win this game. So I feel all right about this. Mm. Um, and then you're, you are going to need the Lash. So let's see if I can. Hmm. Mm, Flock Small saying that they might have fought with the Shulor to not get marked. This is a solid, solid thought too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, so this actually worked out decently well. Uh, going into Dis, playing both the Library and the Lash, mm -hmm. getting a Reap. <clears throat> nice.
Okay. Go for some efficiency here, I think. Just play that QMAX. Let me fight it. It'll be great. <laughs> you already no, got my drummer knot. <laughs> Let's play the survey. Hmm. Definitely going to discard the causal loop. Platform. Play that. Nice. And I don't think I have a reason to play Garcia at all. Cool. Uh, well, I am going this. Uh, gonna get a reap. Gonna get an uh, archive, and gonna lash you. Yep. And end the turn. Okay. So I don't want you to continue to be able to lash me and gain an amber. So I am gonna go dis. Gonna play the orb of Invidious. Cool. Um, gonna play a whale of the damned to kill that shore boo and then let's see here I think, think I want to play this for the pip in the cycle. Waking Nightmare. Hmm. Okay, key cost of six. Two amber in the pool. Got my Rustnar. I think that'll do it. Yes. Uh, going untamed, taking the archives. Camouflage my Rustnar. Reap. Uh, quicksand. Blow up my dude. Do a thing with another pip song of spring. Regrowth the Choda. No way. Come yeah. on. <laughs> How did you have that many pips in Untamed? <laughs> wow. Nice game. Nice game. GG. Uh, I had I had the um, key lock in hand, too, which is waiting for the right time to play it. Did not think you'd be able to get five amber that turn out of that. Mm -hmm. Damn. Yeah. I was hoping that the like reap and then blow up my Untamed dude with quicksand would be good, but uh, the quicksand or the quicksand and the song of spring were both ways to clear out my untamed dudes. So I felt good mm -hmm. about having just untamed dudes left. Um, Continue but, to tell me all your secrets as I'm about to switch decks with you. Hey, you know, uh, I'm just gonna play turn one Quixel and win. So don't worry about it. <laughs> Probably. Uh, I thought I I thought I was in really good shape there, despite the uh, the Tesmal stuff. I thought I was I had enough amber control mm -hmm. um, to make it work, but. Apparently not. Mm -hmm. um, hmm. Awkward hand. Less awkward hand. All right. Let's. Um, oh, man, this is a tough call. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to go with the library first. That is nice. Um, yeah. He's got, <laughs> he's got it. He's <laughs> got it. Of course he does. <laughs> but I'm going to give you some, I'm going to give you some uh, counterplay opportunities. I'm going to play a dude and put a stunner on it. Uh, yeah. So do your worst. Um, fan fantastic. Fantastic. Um, <laughs> That's that's going to be game. I'm almost sure of it because you have more pips than me. You have amber control. Um, I'm pretty certain that's going to do it. Uh, going into logos, playing my things. Forge compiler. Yeah, I'll throw some damage on there. Discard a thing. 
Oof, this is lining up. <clears throat> we'll see. Yeah, I already drew the gang or not. <laughs> Good deck. Good deck. <laughs> mm hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Fight my dude, that's cool. Ugh. Quixel. This is a really sweet Quixel stone though. Pip capture draw. Whew. It is. I know. Um Everything about that Quixel Stone is good. Mm -hmm. It's a great deck for it. It's got the platform with it. Um, a lot of good synergies. Mm -hmm. Back in the Brobnar. Okay. One two punch that drummer not. Oh, nice. Oh, it's oh, it's only enemy. Come on, AOA. Enemy creatures. What? what AOA kind of... has <laughs> so many actions that should affect both players, but don't. What and kind I of? Don't get it. Thorium plasmate nonsense is that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, let's see. Let's see if you're foolish enough to play a creature now. Ooh. Maybe. <clears throat> Maybe. Oh, yeah. Poke 2 from Dataforge Stream saying, yeah, how many times do you want to poke your own dudes? All the time. Like, every time I play poke, I'm so like, much. I wish I could poke my own dude. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, had, I had a play in mind, but now it feels bad. You should um, just do it. I, I Give should. the viewers what they want. Do you have any They want waste chain bidding in game three is what they want. I don't think you have ways to pump. Pump your stuff. Uh, uh. I mean, I'm just going to be... I'm going to be... This is, is going to be the, <laughs> the most annoying game. <laughs> the people came for the violence. <laughs> yeah. Should I shuffle in the gang or not again, do you think? Mm, you know, it's a thing you could do. Uh, I'm I might be really greedy. I might be super greedy. Um Actually, this isn't even that greedy. Discard that. Not even when I play the Kirby. I it thought about like a good it. Play. I thought about it. I could play the Kirby. So I could play the Kirby, bounce it, and then uh, play something bigger, some beefier dudes. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't know. Well, um, now you let me play my Smith, so joke's on you. You can have the key for nine. I think I'm okay with that. Yeah. You gonna keep the Garcia out too? Not this time. Maybe next time. After I kill your Rustnar with something, I might. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. They're everywhere. Regrowth. Just to discard the Fang House. Camouflage. Reap, Sauna Spring. Hmm. 
Hmm. Now you are really tempting me to be greedy. I'm going to do it. I'm going to be super greedy. Mm -hmm. Garcia. I'm going to replay the Garcia. And let you forage for 13. <laughs> <laughs> yep. All right, finally found that lash. There's the lash. Binding yep. irons. And let's go Tesmol. Ooh. All right, interesting. That changes things a little bit. Uh, huh. I think I am gonna go back into Star Alliance. Fight into your uh, Rusnar. Mm -hmm. Stun this Tezmal. Bounce the Garcia. Play the Garcia. And uh, play back the star. <laughs> okay. I got this. Sensible. Lash. Discarding some things. Okay, uh, I guess now, uh, now I have to, uh, probably deal with this Tesmol. I guess I could reap, stun it, and repeat. Yeah, let's do that. That seems fun. Sure, why not? <laughs> that seems fun. <laughs> oh, love the uh, Orb of Invidious um, transporter platform combo, though, right? It's pretty solid. Pretty solid, pretty solid. Thought about, uh, it would have been greedy to play that uh, Yorg. Yeah, would have been greedy to play that Yorg. Okay. Let's go for the blood money. Mm -hmm. One, two punch. Mm -hmm. One, two punch. Finally. Get Punched rid of that for good. All right. Well, that's a key. I'll take it. Um, all right. We're going to go. We're going to go dis. Um, now I need to think a little bit. Took away the ability to mark of dis me, but mm -hmm. I don't know how big of a deal that'll be. We'll draw a card. Okay, I like that. Obsidian Forge seems nice. Uh. Hmm. Let's blow up these one two punches. Let's mark of dis my own creeper. Ugh. Smash these duders. Smash this duder. Discard the rest of the stuff. All right. Let's just show you another Tez. Oh, that's cool. Lash and library. 
Mm -hmm. Very nice. I'm going to go back into this, take this one, play this one, play this one, shuffle. <laughs> I did think about keeping a mark around. I maybe should have. Yeah. No, um, I don't think so. Yeah, I, I you think you could always the, obsidian forge. Could obsidian forge, and I feel like the the orb slows down Tesmol enough that I like one turn is not so bad. All right, how's that little taste of your own medicine there? Nice. Pretty good, pretty good. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm. Let me go Star Alliance. Play I think my deck probably wins nine out of ten games it does feel like it's got the edge i do think like a significant edge and this time even if you had game. just stopped at six amber that last game i think i win because mm -hmm. like the key lock would come out there's a garcia with the platform coming things like that um i think i could have enough pips to win that game if you didn't have like the the big walk-off turn there Yeah, it was a very fortunate turn. Very fortunate turn. Yeah, seven, I think, keeps you in dis. Um, seven keeps you in dis. Yeah, both games had an early quicksill. I had, I think I had a, enough of a rush before the quicksill came to put some pressure on. And then my... Uh, okay, charrette. Don't hate that. Archiving a thing. I'm just going to go logos here. Um, archive this one. Discard. 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 Draw some stuff. Okay. Yeah, early Brobner with no quicksell changes a lot. Like this deck, uh, like a an un, uncontested gang or not, and there's the, the lava ball and coward's end to clear the way if need be. Uh, either or uh, could go a long way for sure. Mm. All right, what's it gonna be? Uh, you just drew six new ones. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So, probably gonna call this. No dis. Maybe some chains to go with it as well. Discard the shore. A lash. Getting a beefy archive here. I have some I have some nonsense. So you may have a, a walk off key brewing of your own. That would be fun. Um one, two, three, four, five. Nine, so I'll get to nine. That's probably good. Let's see. Star Alliance, uh, start with a survey. Don't want to draw either of these, but I guess I prefer that one. Um, do it this way. Throw some upgrades on this Garcia. Increase your key cost and uh, consolidate my board. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, 
Um, we'll go Brobnar and play the Smith for a few. Mm -hmm. Play the Lava Ball. Give you back all your Amber. Mm -hmm. Bramo, Drummer, not Bramo for Spite. I was like a turn away from getting this Ganger Knot off to begin with. Mm -hmm. Which, um, who knows, might have been enough. But like the Orb of Nvidia stops it dead, the Quixel stops it dead, and you end up getting them both. Yep. Good game. Ooh, good game. Well played. My reign yeah, of terror um, in the sloppy sex that league continues. Apparently. Yeah. <laughs> um, I had a hand of Chota and three untamed pips now. Um, was archiving the untamed all game, but yeah, you know, what's it good for? Yeah, the pips, there are an awful lot of pips in Untamed, which is interesting. Um, and I think if that Brobnar hits, uh, if that Brobnar hits right before either the orb or Quixel come down, that, that deck can walk away with it. I did also, yeah. I think I, I probably stole a key with the Tezmals um, being timely as oh, yeah. well in the first game. <laughs> right. Yeah, that was nuts. Um, I think you came down with the Tezmal right as right before I played the Quixel. Yes, so you played... And I did not have the orb at that point either. Yep, yep, and then you found the removal for the first one, and then I think I immediately had the second, uh, which was just a, a lucky draw, um, but all right. Well, this ceremonial now, I don't know if you've looked already, but uh, to check out the uh, Saz of these decks, I'm always curious. I, uh, I know what mine was. I checked it. Um, I'm going to guess yours is... Probably close to mine. Probably like about a 70. Hmm. Mine's a 72. The big 63. Big 63 for me. It's interesting because it's got a lot of creature control. Um, it's got mm -hmm. the gang or not combo. It's got the lash in the library, which adds some efficiency in three houses that don't normally have any of it. Yep. Uh, I'm surprised that's a 63. That must be the AOA tax, I think. <laughs> the AOA tax. Yeah, the... The Brobnar it likes comes in at 24 with the Brobnar, starting off with that Drummer Knot and Ganger Chieftain, Smith at 2, and then it kind of tapers off a little bit. Um, it's it's mildly warm on the Dis. Um, puts the Dis at 22 with Schuler, Library, Charette at the top, double Tesmal. The A uh, the Untamed, excuse me, it doesn't care for a ton. Um, it thinks not highly of the key charge, uh, which is probably fair. Um, though it I didn't think you'd get value out of your key cheats, but you did. Yeah, yeah only nine pips, so you're right. Uh, uh, a decent number of them in Untamed. Although, interesting yep. that... Okay, decent number of them in Untamed. So, of the nine, I have five five pips in Untamed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you, were, you still had like 10 or 12 cards left in your deck, and you had all of them, I think. Yeah. I may have been missing there everywhere, but the last turn was quicksand, regrowth, psalm of spring, camouflage, and then a reap. Yeah. Yep. yep. So four out of five of them. Four yeah. out of five of them. And uh, not a ton of amber control, as you noted. Um, yeah, there's a groke that I missed as well. So it's like groke and um, lash and shuler. Yep. Groke, shuler, charette, lash. Mm -hmm. Charette, yeah. Nothing in untamed. Yeah, it does not like... The Amber Control Metascore it's minus a, one Amber Control. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say probably minus Metascore for the Amber Control, yeah. Um, is it a minus one total Metascore or minus one just for the Amber Control? Minus one for the Amber Control, plus one on board clears. Yeah, the mm -hmm. board control, the C coming in at 16, which you'd think would be mitigated by the uh, Quixel, right? Uh, those board clears count for not a ton. But, yep. Uh, Interesting. Yeah. Um, my turn one play, I ended up going with the library. I thought about going with Binding Irons just to slow you down a little bit more. Um, did you get dealt with the Quixel after you mulliganed? I mulliganed into the Quixel, yeah. Yeah, so. Yeah, and I, I, threw, I threw back a pretty nice seven card, or a six card hand, but yeah, found Quixel. And I think assembled the transporter platform and some of the draw pip 
un, uh, star alliance upgrades slash creatures pretty quickly yeah um if i had managed to pull out that game one i think we both agree that the mass mutation is the better deck how much would you be bidding on it mm, that is a good question um mm. probably not much is my gut Probably, I, I don't think I'd go higher than maybe three or four. Um, yeah, I'd say, I was going to say two or three. Two or three. Yeah, uh, I think if in your shoes, I might go maybe even, maybe four, um, being on the on the play uh, and shedding an extra chain for free-ish. Um, so you're probably mulliganing for Quixel, looking for a, a, one, a nice one card drop. Um, yeah. You have... Yeah, Even the, Orb is almost as good as Quixel. Orb is great too. I mean, the, the real trick here is your board control is targeted uh, and uh, like, okay, you've got the implosion, you've got the whale, um, but unless you hit Orb or Quixel early, then there's mm -hmm. a decent chance that the Brobnar dudes run away with the game. Um, yep. So I'd be worried about going too heavy on chains. Uh, yeah. Uh, I also w would worry about the double binding irons against mm -hmm. it. Because if you bid too high and they get dealt with uh, a binding irons or two, you're like in a bind, so to speak. <laughs> of <it>? irons. <laughs> of <laughs> irons, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I definitely, when I'm bidding, I always look for things like binding irons because it can really mess up your chain bidding if like, you think like okay five is the max here and then suddenly first turn you, you're you get eight you yep. know like it can really hurt that's that's true although i think the, i mean the binding irons you would imagine their impact is accounted for in the outcome of the first two matches right like they're, they're yeah the, but i think yeah. I, I think we agree that finding the artifacts early is pretty important to mm -hmm. mccormick winning this one and yeah you're going to have a hard time doing that if you go over six chains. The, yes, I agree with that. I agree with that. It makes, certainly makes it harder. Um, and if it's not in your opener, the search for it is going to be painful. Um, mm -hmm. It doesn't help that Lethologica doesn't pick up any of those. Um, yeah. yeah, it's a dangerous Lethologica. Yep. It is. It is. There's not a ton you're really searching for in in Logos. I could, mm -hmm. I could see that Lethalogica being a discard. Honestly, um, I considered it in game one. Um, I only lost the Mark of Dis, but I don't think a Mark of Dis made a difference. Um, I think at that point you were already. Uh, it it might have helped a little bit. I don't know if it would have made the big difference, but I, I did think about discarding the Lethalogica. Yeah, in turn one, in the game one. Sorry, I was. I was keeping, tra you know, m m aware of my reach, right? Like with the pips and untamed and the key cheat, um, very likely, if not left with only untamed creatures to use my, um, my gateway so that I'd be able to, uh, have a clear board of creatures, um, uh, to play Chota. Hmm. Yeah. So I think yeah, the marker disc was was not didn't hurt, but if you were still still searching for Quixel with chains in hand, I I'd probably be tempted to discard Lethalogica. And yeah, Data Forge Stream saying <laughs> Lethalogica is a bad card. It's uh, a <laughs> yeah, hot take, hot take. I don't know. I I I did I did actually catch uh the stream or recall the stream where uh Zach was talking about Lethalogica being overrated, and I think in a lot of cases it is. Uh, I'd agree with that for sure. I think there are decks where it is it is very strong, um, but I think it's not a, a universally very strong card. So that's fair. Um, what does it come rated at? Three point two. Three point two, and the efficiency of two point two is a little bit of a head scratcher um, because you're you're never drawing more than a card. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, we could probably dig down into the, that calculation, but um, it, it probably has something to do with cycling your deck and shuffling back. Yeah, 
Yeah, I guess in theory, you're discarding a bunch of non-Logos things. So maybe you can make a case for the remainder of your deck being a little bit more Logos dense. Um, yeah. Hmm, interesting. But, I, 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 don't, yeah. I don't think it's a bad card. Um, I have some decks that it's fantastic. Like when you have three of them together and you have a bunch of Logos cards that you want as like your, you know, play a bunch of creatures and reap with them, um, like three Torados. It's pretty good there. Um, mm. Better in bad decks, bad in mid decks, than good in than good again in great decks. Says Foxamol. Yeah, mm. uh, I give this one a, a big fat. It depends. <laughs> a big fat. It depends. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. I think certainly a dangerous play. I would call it in uh, in McCormick in this matchup. Does it have the? Uh, the attribute dangerous random play it does not it has mills no. friendly place cards and good actions hmm. yeah good actions what do you think about that data forge stream good actions <laughs> <laughs> it's like a <laughs> it sounds like a song like i was like good vibrations i don't know <laughs> all right cool well uh it was a fun game uh uh yeah yeah try sloppy sex set a lot of fun uh from folks oh uh, and i think one other note uh data force stream reminding me here and that i often remark with uh not tonight who i play sloppy sex set with an awful lot um we very often find that we end up bidding on lower saz decks or that lower saz decks uh uh come out on top of these encounters and this may be a topic for another 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 uh, time, but um, or maybe just be a thing that everybody knows already. But I feel like Saz is a great indicator for where decks, like like a directional indicator for decks within a large pool of decks. You know, for for a deck's value or or relative strength within a larger pool of decks. But I think you have to be wary of it, wary of using it as. Uh, a thing to tell you how one matchup is going to go between two very yeah. specific decks, right? Um, Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so very interesting to see, like, uh, Roscom's still a game, but uh, I think, yeah, definitely McCormick is a a stronger deck in general, I would, I would say. But, um, yeah, I'm a little surprised at the... I guess maybe you shouldn't be, but the expected amber of 12 in Roscombe, because it does have things like Blood Money and Smith that both seem like pretty decent chance at getting value out of those. So I'm a little surprised that the expected is so small. Um, mm. Yeah, the, the arc split on that deck is interesting. Huh. And Rusnar getting a tiny, tiny little bump for gobbling up an amber pip quicksand it says you're... zero four <laughs> quicksand it says you're probably playing most of the time hmm. interesting yeah and no um gang... no gang or not yeah mentioned in the expected it is interesting. Amber. Hmm. that's a good point Flox what do they Mall. count that as is that other do you have over the gang or not yeah drummer not comes in at other uh yeah 2.66 and other for the drum or not yeah, dr dr okay. Interesting. Yeah, that's one of those weird quirks that um, you could take advantage of during the doppelganger event, where mm -hmm. the the other was like, could be a key cheat, could be expected amber, like it is with drummer, uh, drummer not, could be like a lot of different things, like mimicry. It could be, you know, it, it's just it's totally random what that other means, and I don't, I don't remember if other was part of the split that they counted. Um, but you can find some some hidden gems like something that might have a little bit more expected amber than expected, um, like this one. <laughs> so, um, yeah. you if you played this in doppelganger, you'd be playing against something that likely did not have that um, that mm. little extra boost, unless it had a gang or not of its own. A little more variability there. Interesting. Interesting. I hadn't thought about that. I'm trying to remember. I'd now. say this could be a decent uh, doppelganger deck. It could be Roscoe. Yeah, this the stats are not terribly exciting, especially the yeah. amber related stats. Yeah, 
Hmm. It'd be interesting to check. Interesting to try. I'm trying to remember now how many of the like rector doppelgangers had ganger not as well. I just remember the one that had a uh, Jenka that we saw twice. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. The rector uh, doppelgangers were all insane. They were all like really, really good decks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like it might have been the toughest pool, which is interesting because it was like one of the lower sized decks that we brought. I still have nightmares about the uh, the double. Uh redacted deck that i faced with uh, uh mm. green wasp <laughs> like <laughs> yep that was an afk deck i think wasn't it <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah that uh, was tough i have i have nightmares about playing south got and all the capturing against the exile yeah you you because when we played i think i got like the one deck with either with r or was it, it was like r or like r paired with um, uh, the redistribution card. What was it? What's that called? Or called? Equalize. Equalize. Ugh. I think you had Equalize and Exile and R, if I'm not mistaken. Just like, yeah. Totally silly. Totally silly. But yeah, Flux Mall has it right too. High Disruption got very scary in, Doppel, in Doppelganger. Mm. I agree with that. I stayed away from, That's... I tried to stay away from that Disruption. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. Yeah, I didn't, I don't know if I intentionally avoided Disruption. Um, I went for a strategy of a board-based deck that had very low creature control, and that ended up being like a, a Curia Equalized Spirit's Way deck um, that did pretty well. Double two, Rector. Let's see. We can see how many. Uh, oh, you still have the doppels up. I still have the doppels. Haven't deleted these tags. Uh, let's see how many have... How do you deal with that? Like, don't you have like a bunch of tags showing all the time? So there's, oh, you there's hide a, them. yeah, there's, there's a cool thing. Okay. So wait, uh, six, six gang or not rector doppels in the pool. Uh, this is a cool tip that I didn't know until I was going through to clean this up. Um, but you can archive a tag, right? And then it's not been deleted. It's still there in the background, but it's only going to show up on the list if that deck has been tagged with that tag, right? So when I look at random a random deck in DOK, you'll notice that these ones here are all showing the doppel two rector tag. Uh, if I look at my decks, uh, generally, uh, those other ones aren't gonna show it, just, uh, just the ones that I've kind of don't have archived. So you can search for archive tags, but you can't see mm-hmm. them normally? Mm-hmm. They don't clutter your. They don't clutter the view here. You can't assign it to a new one unless you unarchive it. Um, but they'll be visible on decks that have that tag. Yep. Very good tip. I like it. Yeah. So I archived all of our doppel decks, ta- all of our doppel tags, um, but left them there for in case folks, you know, st- um, actually do really enjoy playing doppelganger games. Um, they're they make for good matchups. Um, we found an interesting thing out too. Uh, through some through some games where your doppel is almost kind of like at the center of the cloud of decks that it generates doppelgangers that it generates and usually has interesting games uh with other doppels in that cloud but if you pick two random doppels to play against each other but not the one that spawned the the pool uh uh, wasn't always as great because there you can kind of get um you can kind of get decks on opposite opposite edges if you will so yeah. if your deck's in the middle and then there's the ones on the outside of rim yeah <clears throat> but interesting cool. it's cool it's kind of if you think of like a like a k nearest neighbor search but then neighbors of neighbors are not necessarily neighbors yeah i don't know yeah <laughs> yeah i know what you mean yeah yeah, yeah. but fun <clears throat> clouds of decks yeah so, ah, clouds of decks hmm. hmm decks in the clouds i don't know Okay. Well, cool. Well, we should uh, wrap it up there so we can uh, get things off to our editor for the hot press yeah. take. Yeah. Yeah. Make sure that the editor like starts right away because we've got to release this, this <laughs> podcast tomorrow. It's uh, chop shop. <laughs> chop shop. Yeah. We can double their salary if that helps. Oh, done. <laughs> Maybe triple. <laughs> done. You got it. Triple. <laughs> triple. Cool. All right, folks. Well, uh, we'll sign off then. Uh, Thanks, y'all, for hanging out with us. Uh, We had fun. Hope you had fun. Yeah.
Thanks for watching, everybody. See you next week. Bye.